Bethlehem College and Seminary is still accepting applications for the coming academic year. For more information, visit bcsmn.edu. Gandalf paused and then said slowly in a deep voice, This is the master ring, the one ring to rule them all. This is the one ring he lost many ages ago to the great weakening of his power. He greatly desires it, but he must not get it. Frodo sat silent and motionless. Fear seemed to stretch out a vast hand like a dark cloud rising in the east and looming up to engulf him. This ring, he stammered. How, how on earth did it come to me? Ah, said Gandalf, that is a very long story. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. All the same, said Frodo, even if Bilbo could not kill Gollum, I wish he had not kept the ring. I wish he had never found it, and that I had not got it. Why did you let me keep it? Why didn't you make me throw it away or destroy it? I do really wish to destroy it, cried Frodo. Or, well, to have it destroyed. I am not made for perilous quests. I wish I had never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Such questions cannot be answered, said Gandalf. You may be sure that it was not for any merit that others do not possess, for, not for power or wisdom at any rate, but you have been chosen, and you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. In 1783, the Tenmei famine began in northern Japan, causing ultimately over a million deaths. In 1939, the Winter War in Finland saw the bombing of Helsinki, the capital, and homelessness of over 300,000 Finnish people. Between Hernando de Soto's arrival in the American Southeast in 1539 and the Indian Removal Act of 1830, numerous Native American tribes were displaced to other parts of the continent and ravaged by disease. And in 597 BC, Jerusalem was besieged by the Babylonian Empire and sent into, they were sent into exile over 10,000 Israelites, mostly their leadership, stealing their religious treasures and utterly changing their society. Quote, none remained except the poorest people of the land. This sad litany of stories from history of famine, of war, disease and displacement, collapse, it demonstrates that, that living in an age of trouble is not unique to ourselves here and now. Our troubles are simply that, ours. They're evidence that we're part of the human family, all of us subject to this condition called life under the curse. And what we in this room need is what all human beings have needed since the, the fall, which is a way of living well day by day through all the years of life that we're granted. And the Christian life, its beliefs and its practices, is the ultimate, the best, and because given by God, the true way for us humans to live in this age. But to get through our troubled lives, one essential need we have is for hope. We need hope because we look out at the next moment, the next day, or the next decade, and often we can't see the world in it, any decent possibility that our lives will come good or that things will be all right. When we don't have hope, we find it difficult to make well-judged moral decisions and take action that's fitting to our calling as Christians. And part of the reason for the difficulty is that times of trouble bring about stuff outside of you and inside of you, right? Outside of us, objectively, troubles result in conflict pain, chaos, failure, loss, and ultimately death. Every single one of us in this room will have some time in your life you'll experience those things. We've all just lived through a time when a strange disease that you didn't cause invaded our families. Um, some of us lost loved ones that are precious to us, and our society had no idea how to handle it, um, kind of ground to a halt. All it takes sometimes is just a little bit of snowfall, just one twitch of a steering wheel on an on-ramp, and you can have your life and others shoved onto a path that you 
did not expect. And the amount of pain and difficulty on it is difficult for you to have previously imagined. But subjectively, also, inside ourselves, in our hearts and minds, troubles have serious ramifications. They engender in us fear, doubt, anxiety, exhaustion, feelings of futility and helplessness, all of which incapacitate us. We feel paralyzed sometimes. We're unable to overcome our own inner feelings if we're left to our own resources. We're unable to take the next step because the situation's just too oppressive. We're unable even to discern and to know what is the right thing to do even if we could take the next step. All of it just seems so very, very impossible. We're left weak, blind, and helpless. John Ronald Ruel Tolkien knew about troubles too. Um, in 1895... 1895, he lost his father at age three. He then lost his mother at age 12, but not before she and her two boys could be essentially disowned by her family because of her conversion to Roman Catholicism. So they were left financially destitute. Tolkien and his brother were then housed and raised by a local Catholic priest in Birmingham, England, from whom Tolkien claimed he first learned charity and forgiveness. And as a young man, Tolkien, like all the young Englishmen of his generation, was thrust into World War I in France. And even though he only spent four months at the front, he was at the horrific Battle of the Somme. And if you know your history, you know that over a million men died at that battle. Some of the folks he lost were his closest friends from Oxford with whom he went to war. What gave him hope in the face of all of these troubles? I think he developed a reliance upon the Christian story so that his remarkable writings that we all love so much, the reason why we're here, right? They're suffused with that reality. Uh, The man who had to look the darkness of World War I in the face found enough hope and truth in the Christian story that he could tell us with Sam In the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach, which means that our own experienced darkness is also small and passing. Our hope and our hopeful action and faith, persevering to the end as God's children, requires that we know this very, very well. Because a hope that looks beyond the walls of the world helps situate and orient our own individual troubles and actions. So, what we're going to do tonight is simply look at a handful of scenes in The Lord of the Rings and let Tolkien teach us about hope as Christians who need it. The focus is largely on Frodo and Sam, but you could go to multiple other characters, right? Um, the main point of what I want us to see together is that Tolkien's book shows human beings cannot live without hope, and that hope enables other virtues and virtuous action that befits our place in the world. The real hope that you and I need is ultimately found in the good tidings of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. One amongst many ways of having that hope get deep down into our bones is by reading the Lord of the Rings attentively. So here's where we're going. First, brief general definition um, of hope, what it is, what it isn't, but then we'll simply just take five scenes from the book and make some claims about what's being portrayed about them in terms of hope and virtue and action, okay? A few qualifications first, though. First, Um, we really, sadly, can't address everything that we would want to. Um, I know a lot of you in this room know the books as well or better than I do, and there will always be things that I'm going to have to leave out and that you would love to discuss, and so would I. Um, That makes me sad. Second, I'm operating as strictly as I can from the book rather than the movies. So we're going to let Tolkien be the guide and not Peter Jackson... Um, That includes the Amazon shows, which I have not seen. Third, the kind of reading I'm offering tonight is in the same category as that which my third-year theology students at Bethlehem College make. We there study a bit of the Silmarillion, and we get some help with the Christian doctrine of God and of creation. Um, 
It tries to interpret literature by including a theological lens as one legitimate way to interpret the book, the book amongst others. And lastly, uh, the last qualification is that we have to remember that Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. While it is indeed, per its author's intention, a deeply Christian work, it was also intentionally not allowed to be a story that simply retells Christianity and its story. It doesn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between events and characters in each world, okay? So it's literature, more precisely, it's, it's feigned history, which depends, quote, on its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers, Tolkien says. So we shouldn't be surprised that the plot of Lord of the Rings doesn't follow exactly with the plot of the Bible. We should also not be surprised that no single character is the Christ figure. Um, Numerous characters in the book are like Jesus Christ, right? Um, Frodo, who bears evil into the land of fire and death to destroy it by giving up his life. Gandalf, who fights the fire demon in the depths of the world and is resurrected. Aragorn, who is the rightful king, whose glory is hidden beneath the humble clothes of a ranger. They're all Christ figures because they are all virtuous in a Christian way. The events of the field of Cormalan are like a picture of eternal life and reward for Christians, yet these are not the primary realities. And Tolkien wanted the primary reality respected. Likewise, we should also expect to see correspondences, likenesses of true things that God has revealed in the Bible, also in the histories that each of us experiences, right? people that you know, things that have happened to you. Um, what we call our lives will correspond in some way. As a friend recently put it, Lord of the Rings is a hopeful story rather than a story about hope. Okay, so hope defined. Brief orientation by what we mean by the, by the term. Um, I'm an academic, this is what we do. When we speak of hope, it's important that we not allow our culture's current understanding of the term alone to inform what we mean to limit us. All agree, hope is directed toward the future. It, it doesn't yet exist. And often enough, we speak of hope simply as um, a human emotion, um, a wishful feeling of expectation and desire for certain things to happen. It's merely a wishful thought to which we give no consideration to its grounds. So, for instance, I hope that Aberdeen Football Club win the Scottish Premiership this year. It's not gonna happen. Um, or we can confuse hope with what Oliver Don O'Donovan calls anticipation. He says, it's, anticipation is the imaginative projections drawn from the past horizon of the present and extending the orderly pattern of events into the future. Okay? Anticipations are founded inductively on what we know of the world and its regularities. So to anticipate the future is different than hope because anticipation is a sort of a reasonable prediction of what will likely happen next based on what we currently know about the world's possibilities. So for example, the disciples on that mountainside had five loaves and two fish and they anticipated that this could not feed 5,000 people. Or Denethor, steward of Gondor, anticipated that there was no victory possible against the shadow and power of Mordor because that's what his knowledge of the world told him. And Denethor is a key instance of this in the story, right? His actions and his reasoning are limited by what he thinks he knows by way of the Palantir. He acts as if he can see all ends. He and his heroic son Boromir anticipate in this case that they must and can bring the ring to Gondor and use it to secure their earthly kingdom. The, that possibility makes sense to them. That's anticipation. But hope is different than that. Hope can imagine a future that's outside the possibilities offered by this world alone. So hope looks to things that are not seen, according to Hebrews. He, Hope acknowledges the limits of its own knowledge and reason, too. Hope hears a promise spoken from beyond into this world and trusts that it could be so one day. That future promise fulfillment is essential to our hope and therefore essential to our present moral acting. Oliver O'Donovan again. But what hope can, can discover within the immediate future is the possibility of a witness 
to ultimate promise, the power of an act which, whatever its objective and worldly possibilities, it can articulate a clear message about the purposes of God. It is this possibility on which hope will focus deliberation, showing us ways of action that had apparently no prospects, but now seem to have them in light of the shed promise. Even such apparently pointless acts as suffering martyrdom for the truth suddenly have a point since they are aligned with the future known by promise, not by anticipation. No act of ours could be a condition for the ultimate future. On the contrary, it is the condition for our acting. It alone underwrites the intelligibility of our human purposes, rewarding them beyond our desert and judging them in mercy." End quote. So that's a, that's a key element of our moral reason. The way in which we envision the future in all of its scope has a tremendous impact on our next moral choice and action, right? Should I despair of any success here? Should I limit my options to just these? While anticipation has its proper place in your life, right? You could not get through a day without anticipating what comes next. Hope is the virtue which points us to the possible future where true goodness awaits us. And you can observe the difference here between Denethor and Faramir, his son. Denethor says to him, "Um, but in desperate hours, gentleness may be repaid with death. Remember, this is for him letting Frodo and the ring go. And Faramir replies, so be it. Or, as Gandalf says at the Council of Elrond about what should be done with the ring before that, he says, despair or folly, says Gandalf. It is not despair, for despair is only for those who see the end beyond all doubt. We do not. It is wisdom to recognize necessity when all other courses have been weighed, though as folly it may appear to those who cling to false hope. Well, let folly be our cloak, a veil before the eyes of the enemy. For he is very wise and weighs all things to a nicety in the scales of his malice. But the only measure that he knows is desire for power. And so he judges all hearts. Into his heart the thought will not enter that any will refuse it. That having the ring we may seek to destroy it. If we seek this, we shall put him out of reckoning. Scene one. The ring goes from the shire. So the passage with which I opened was from Book 1, Chapter 2, Shadow of the Past, in which Gandalf's returned to the Shire to explain to Frodo, verify his hunch about the ring that Frodo has. I want to just expand that scene and go and make a couple of observations. Gandalf says, The enemy is fast becoming very strong. We shall be hard put to it. The enemy still lacks one thing to give him strength and knowledge to beat down all resistance and cover the land in a second darkness. He lacks the one ring. The Shire, he may be seeking for it now if he has not already found it. Indeed, Frodo, I fear that even the, he may even think that the long unnoticed name of Baggins has become important. But this is terrible, cried Frodo. Far worse than the worst that I imagined from your hints and warnings. O oh, Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. What am I to do? So it's at this moment that the gravity of the situation really starts to hit Frodo for the first time. He's now able to imagine the real danger that he and his home place are in. This irreplaceable place, along with all of its people, are now in danger of being pulled from his grasp forever. The scene that he and Sam see in the mirror of Galadriel later reinforced this possibility. And the first reaction he has to this knowledge, did you notice, is a wish. I wish it had never come to me. That's really natural. <laughs> I wish this cancer had never happened. I wish the danger could be unwound. Second, though, he asks, why? Why was I chosen? This, too, is natural, to ask about someone else's agency in your own misery, right? But notice what he then says. What am I to do? He's fearful, but he doesn't remain paralyzed. He has already some beginning of an idea of the greatness of the enemy who pursues him and the domination of his land, right? He says, this is terrible, far worse than the worst that I imagined. The enemy is so strong and terrible. Yet, he sets his mind to act. 
I argue that Frodo does so because he has some form of hope. And we see it a few later, pages later in his reply. He says, I should like to save the Shire, if I could, though there have been times when I thought the inhabitants too stupid or dull for words and have felt that an earthquake or an invasion of dragons might be good for them. But I don't feel that now. I feel that as long as the Shire lies behind, safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. I shall know that somewhere there's a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there again. Of course, I've sometimes thought of going away, but imagine that as a kind of holiday, a series of adventures like Bilbo's, or better, ending in peace. But this would mean exile. A flight from danger into danger, drawing it after me, and I suppose I must go alone if I am to do that and save the Shire. But I feel very small and very uprooted and, well, desperate. So Frodo desires the Shire to be saved, to be safe and comfortable, and ultimately that it would be at peace. And that, that vision, not only that the Shire is presently at peace, but that it might be so again for him when he returns to it one day, that is what makes his wandering more bearable. The vision of the Shire is a firm foothold, even when he is uprooted, and gives him fuel to go out the door and undertake the next dreadful steps. That's an essential characteristic of hope. We have to be able to imagine a future day and place where our lives are whole, even if common sense right now tells you that it's impossible. Karen Swallow Pryor, in her great little book on reading well, borrows a definition from Thomas Aquinas. She says the conditions are hope of hope are that it regards something good in the future that is difficult but possible to obtain. So here, Frodo, in a small measure, sets before himself just the slightest hope that he could one day save the Shire, somehow. Almost as if he has to ignore the scale and scope of the enemies that are now against him. At this point, he knows very little, even about the nine riders. Frodo's hope will grow as he grows on his journey. From this initial kind of temporal earthly hope for the Shire for himself to a hope that is more directed towards the sea and the, the undying lands in the west. But this vision of the Shire at peace continues to recur to Frodo and Sam at key moments in the quest. But notice it, it does so in the form of memories. One example, when Frodo and Sam attempt to skirt past Minas Morgul with Gollum and climb the stairs to the pass of Kirith Ungol, Frodo becomes frozen with fear and exhaustion. He's being pulled by the ring into Minas Morgul, and yet Sam jerks him away onto the side path. And this is what the narrator says. The earth groaned, and out of the city there came a cry, a rending screech, shivering, rising swiftly to a piercing pitch beyond the range of hearing. The hobbits wheeled around towards it and cast themselves down, holding their hands upon their heads. And Frodo stirred. And suddenly his heart went out to Faramir, the storm has burst at last, he thought. This great array of spears and swords is going to Osgiliath. Will Faramir get there in time, get across in time? And who can now hold the fords when the king of the nine riders comes? And other armies will come. I am too late. All is lost. I tarried on the way. All is lost. Even if my errand is performed, no one will ever know. There will be no one I can tell. It will be in vain. Overcome with weakness, he wept, and still the host of Morgul crossed the bridge. And then, at a great distance, as if it came out of memories of the Shire, some sunlit early morning when the day called and doors were opening, he heard Sam's voice speaking. Wake up, Mr. Frodo, wake up! He had, had the voice added, your breakfast is ready. He would hardly have been surprised. Frodo raised his head and then stood up. Despair had not left him, but the weakness had passed. He even smiled grimly, feeling now as clearly as a moment before that he had felt the opposite, that what he had to do, he had to do, if he could, and that whether Faramir or Aragorn or Elrond or Galadriel or Gandalf or anyone else ever knew about it was beside the purpose. He took his staff in one hand and the file in the other, and they set off. There's a connection there 
between future imagined world of peace and real concrete good blessings that you have actually experienced in your life. Frodo's errand looked exceedingly hopeless here, yet he's newly willing to trudge onward because of the memory of peace and life that came to him just at that moment. He could go on, smiling grimly, ready to do what he had to do, because he had a vision of what is good in the world and might be again. Delight in and gratitude for good things are antibodies that fight the disease of despair. That's why it's important also to cultivate those types of good things and Christian gratitude for them in the lives of our families. Scene two, gifts for the journey. In Lothlorien, after the loss of Gandalf, and sorry for spoilers for anybody who hasn't read it, you came to the wrong lecture if that's the case. The fellowship recovers and prepares to continue on. I just want to focus on one aspect of that event, which is Galadriel's gift to Frodo and to Sam. Um, There are two in particular, right? Sam's box of soil and Frodo's star glass. The giving of a parting gift is obviously a custom in many cultures, but these are important for the quest. They're, They're given by Galadriel and Celeborn, quote, to speed you with blessings from our land. And they are given, quote, in memory of Lothlorien. Their purpose is to help the hobbits keep going, keep acting, and overcoming the obstacles that they'll face. But how so? First, Sam is given by Galadriel a small box of earth from her orchard, she says. Which is interesting, because a a bit of soil is not really going to help them as they nearly die multiple times on their way to Mount Doom. And she knows this. Right? Galadriel says, It will not keep you on your road, nor defend you against any peril, but if you keep it and see your home again at last, then perhaps it may reward you. Though you should find all barren and laid waste, there will be few gardens in Middle Earth that will bloom like your garden, if you sprinkle this earth there. So what's the future danger? It's that all might be barren and laid waste that the earth might be so marred that it no longer lives and can give life. Sam is gifted with the stuff to renew and refresh his home place after its seemingly irreparable destruction. And if you've ever seen a landscape that you loved as a a kid, um, having, having been bulldozed for development, you know what I mean by that. He can hope, but he is also gifted with hope that his current and future actions are not undertaken in vain. He can hope that the ruination of his home place and his people who depend on it will once again thrive and bear fruit. What Galadriel knows Sam will one day need in the face of the scouring of the Shire is hope of amending, and thus a vision of what the mended wood might look like. It might be a tiny bit like Lothlorien in its summertime fullness. And so the beauty and peace and restfulness of Lothlorien for Sam and the travelers becomes a memory that propels them into positive, hopeful action in the present. But not without being a sort of future memory of a place that they've not got to yet. Second, Frodo is given the file of Galadriel. She says, In this file is caught the light of Arendil's star, set amid the waters of my fountain. It will shine brighter when night is about you, May it be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. The darkness and the shadow might be so thick that they can't see where to go next, that they would be lost. And real light comes from the heavens, right? From above. And this this file is a bit of heaven. It's given to Frodo to illuminate the way on earth so that they might see. Now, the particular light that he is given is what is key here. Right. This is, we'll talk more about it later, but this is the real great depth of Tolkien's works, why it's so fun. Um, note that this is Arendil's star, she says. It's the evening star, which is the first out at dusk and always shines brightest, and it always does so in the west where the sun sets. Its name by the elves was Gil Estel, the star of hope. It shone and told the peoples of Middle-earth to be hopeful because... Help against evil would indeed come to them from the West. It too is a piece of that far country, something that links Frodo and Sam to a land that is beyond their own immediate circumstances. 
So thus we see Frodo grasping and using the star glass in order to see what to do next. And this light gives him hope that his deeds might matter in the end. By these gifts of hope, seemingly the gift of heaven, the gift of earth, the hobbits are able to orient their deliberation and action, but they're also encouraged by them. And scene three, on the slopes of the Morgai in Mordor. Frodo sighed and was asleep for almost, almost before the words were spoken. Sam struggled with his own weariness, and he took Frodo's hand, and there he sat silent till deep night fell. And then at last, to keep himself awake, he crawled from the hiding place and he looked out. The land seemed full of creaking and cracking and sly noises, but there was no sound of voice or foot. Far above the Ethelduath in the west, the night sky was still dim and pale as evening. There, peeping among the cloud rack above, a dark, above a dark tor, up high in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart. And he looked up out of the forsaken land, and hope returned to him. For, like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing, that there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. His song in the tower had been defiance rather than hope, for then he was thinking of himself. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself by Frodo's side, putting away all fear cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. This is one of the most beautiful and even moving moments in the entire story for me. These two friends have endured through unbelievable hardship, including Sam just rescuing a supposedly dead Frodo from the Tower of Kirith Ungol. And what's in this passage and what lies beneath it in its depths is of great value to us, I think. So first, we can't overlook just the sheer ridiculousness of their position of what they're attempting. The two hobbits have just crossed over the unpassable mountains that no army could pass, that guard Sauron's land. They've done so with very little food and very little water. They're at the end of an extremely long and grueling journey. This land has nothing but ash, rock, uh, sheer drops, and almost no cover on the plains that they have to march across in order to get to Mount Doom. Frodo can basically go no further due to the weight and power of the ring he carries. They've come to the center point of Sauron's power in all of Middle-earth, and the darkness is nearly total. Any reasonable assessment of this would say, foolishness, hopeless, and they would despair and give up. Second, when Sam can't sleep despite his weariness, it's because of worry and fear but here he seemingly gets a gracious revelation, right? Notice which direction he looks. He looks west, and he sees in the far western sky that's still in twilight a bright white star. West is the direction in Middle Earth from where help usually comes. It's come, it comes from the undying land in the west, the lands of the Valar, and the star that he sees is the evening star, the star of Erendil, the star of hope. It's that exact star's light that resides in the glass vial that we just discussed, given to Frodo by Galadriel. But the evening star that Sam sees is not a star like ours, which you could see if it wasn't cloudy tonight. Their star is the light of the last Silmaril, the great jewel of light of the original two trees of Valinor that Arendil and Elwing bore across the sea in a ship far back in the First Age as they sailed to the far west to plead for help from the angelic Valar against Morgoth and the Balrogs and the dragons. It's the same Silmaril that Baron and Luthien themselves cut from the iron crown of Morgoth. The Valar heard, his, heard Arendil's pleas, but set him in his ship in the heavens. And the Silmaril he wore as a sign, quote, a sign that the Valar remembered their plight. So the star is the ship with the Silmaril upon it. The evening star was put there as a promise in which Middle Earth could hope that the darkness would not have the last word. That is the very light that she put in the glass file, and it is that light whose beauty smote Sam's heart. The beauty of this starlight pierced his heart like an arrow, and with it came a thought that darkness, that evil, is small. It's simply derivative of light and goodness and life. 
In Andrew Peterson's words, you could say it, all the death that ever was, if you said it next to life, would barely fill a cup. It's the Christian truth that evil is a privation of the, of the good, of the good of being. And it's absolutely central to the entirety of Tolkien's work, even if it is mixed with a hefty dose of the old Anglo-Saxon despair for the passing away of beautiful things. So now here, Sam can look out at the hideous, terrible evil in front of him, at his and Frodo's remaining deadly path, and he can judge it rightly. The darkness can't win. It will pass away. And remember when Sam asks Frodo earlier, just on the other side of Shelob's tunnel on the stairs, he says, I wonder what sort of a tale we've fallen into. And then Sam himself narrates a couple of things for that we just, we just ourselves narrated from the great legends of old about people who faced just as bleak or worse of danger than they did. And yet they survived and they achieved their quest. And he then realizes what we just learned about the Starglass, about the Silmaril, about Arendil, about the whole of that story against Morgoth. And he says, why, to think of it, we're still in the same tale. It's still going on. Don't the great tales never end? Because he's already discovered that his life is a part of the great story, capital G, of the story of the triumph of good in Middle-earth. And so beauty and truth combine there to return Sam some hope. They are in the great story. Third, remember that it is Sam who is shown the star. As the ring has more and more power over Frodo, the closer and closer he gets to Mordor and to Mount Doom. As Ralph Wood points out, Frodo is actually the one who is overcome most often with help hopelessness. It's Samwise, his friend, who, as he says himself, is, quote, the fool going on hoping and toiling. But just like Sam will literally carry Frodo on his back up the mountain at the end, Sam is also the one who has to carry Frodo's hope for him. And fourth, the results of Sam's hope. Notice what he does. He can lay down and rest and sleep in peace. Being able to stop and rest is a sign of faith and hope. But notice that it isn't straightforwardly hope that he and Frodo will live and survive and, and flourish in their lives. No, remember what he says. For a moment, his own fate and even his master's fate ceased to trouble him. What is that? Is it just self-confidence? Is it it's not recklessness? It's not lovelessness? Or it's not thinking that all things are, are meaningless and empty? It seems to be a settled confidence that the world is such a place that evil cannot be ultimate and that one's own role and deeds, they're good, they fit. Even if no one ever hears about their works, Frodo and Sam have done well and they would keep on doing the best that they could because they trusted again that the outcome didn't ultimately hang on their own shoulders. It's a bit like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They would say, God can save us from this fiery furnace, but even if he does not, we will not bow down to your image. So here, hope engenders trust, courage, endurance, and hopeful action. Now, do we have a similar sort of sign, gift, that's a promise that evil does not win? Do we have a gift that should bring us hope and empower courageous, virtuous action today? We do. We have the Holy Spirit, whom John Owen called Christ's great relic or bequeathment to us. This spirit is the same spirit, right? It fits in the story. It's the same spirit that was given to and empowered our Lord Jesus in his great quest of bearing our sin, defeating our great enemy, but yet he died. Our spirit is his spirit, the spirit who is the gift of Christ given to us so that we may make our way through this world because that spirit is a down payment of the world to come. The spirit of Christ is given to us and this means that every one of us is a part of the great story that really matters and that this, that spirit should point us to the hope of God's future renewal of all things. Scene four, Mount Doom. The lights spring up again. And there, on the brink of the chasm, at the very crack of doom, stood Frodo, black against the glare, tense, erect, but still as if he had been turned to stone. 
Master, cried Sam. Then Frodo stirred and spoke with a clear voice. Indeed, with a voice clearer and more powerful than Sam had ever heard him use, and it rose above the throb and turmoil of Mount Doom ringing in the roof and the walls. I have come, he said, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. And suddenly, as he set it on his finger, he vanished from Sam's sight. Sam got up, and he saw a strange and terrible thing. Gollum, on the edge of the abyss, was fighting like a mad thing with an unseen foe. To and fro he swayed, so near now to the brink that he almost tumbled in, now dragging back, falling to the ground, rising and falling again. Suddenly, Sam saw Gollum's long hand draw upward to his mouth. His white fangs gleamed, and then he snapped as they bit. Frodo gave a cry. And there he was, fallen upon his knees at the chasm's edge. But Gollum, dancing like a mad thing, held aloft the ring, a finger still thrust within its circle. It shone now as if verily it was wrought of living fire. (laughs) Precious, precious, Gollum cried. My precious, oh, my precious. And with that, even as his eyes were lifting up to gloat on his prize, he stepped too far, toppled, wavered for a moment on the brink, and then with a shriek, he fell. Out of the depths came his last wail, precious, and he was gone. (laughs) Tolkien said that he wept when he wrote that scene. Here we see how he wants us to view the fruit of hopeful action. Hope is not the central virtue of the story, I don't think. The most important virtue is pity. All of the great characters exercise it and promote it even above justice. But hope and pity are mutually informing. If you have hope that good might come to you from beyond the walls of the world, then you are free. You can extend pity and mercy much more easily. If you act in pity towards others, you can bear witness to the hope that you have for a future good for yourself and for this one, despite how unreasonable it might appear right now. It's as if the practice of pity is one excellent way of cultivating the virtue of hope. Ask, do you have a hope and a trust that would enable that sort of mercy? Frodo has, along the way, learned it from the wise, most especially Gandalf, and he has himself become wise along with, um, uh, as many characters tell him. And remember, Frodo itself is an old Germanic name and it means wise by experience. True wisdom is quite different than the knowledge of other lesser characters, right? The wisdom of Gandalf and Aragorn and Faramir, Bilbo, now Frodo, is different than, it exceeds that of Saruman and Denethor and even Sauron because they know that there is something beyond the walls of the world. One evidence is that they show pity, most especially to Gollum. And it's exactly here that this story is is so wonderful to me. Um, This scene is what Tolkien calls a catastrophe, right? A good disaster. It's the sudden joyous turn. It's the unlooked for happy ending. It's just not the happy ending that we Americans expect, in which the hero overcomes all the obstacles through strength and cunning and he achieves the victory. No. As Tolkien says in a key passage of his essay on fairy stories, the fairy story's happy ending, quote, does not deny the existence of discatastrophe, of sorrow and failure. The possibility of those is necessary to the joy of deliverance, but it does deny, in the face of much evidence, universal final defeat. And, insofar as it does, is evangelium, gospel. It gives a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. Remember that. Frodo failed. Yet the quest succeeded by an unlooked-for providence that only happened because Frodo and Sam refused to mete out justice to Gollum over and over and over again. As Gandalf predicted, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, and indeed it did. Now, Bilbo didn't necessarily have a full-blown vision of hope of a renewed cosmos, but he still acted virtuously. He still acted as a virtuous hobbit, sparing Gollum. 
Gandalf himself does have that vision. He, if you remember, as the Silmarillion tells, is a, one of the Maya. He's kind of a, a mid-level angel sent to Middle-earth in order to aid elves and men there long ago. But he's explicitly said there to have learned much from the Vala, the angel Niena, the angelic power who cares most for the hurts that the world bears. This is from the Silmarillion. Mightier, mightier than Este is Niena, sister of the Feanturi. She dwells alone. She is acquainted with grief and mourns for every wound that Arda has suffered in the marring of Melkor. But she does not weep for herself. And those who hearken to her learn pity and endurance in hope. Her halls are west of west, upon the borders of the world. And she comes seldom to the city of Valimar, where all is glad. She goes rather to the halls of Mandos, which are near to her own, and all those dead souls who wait in Mandos cry to her because she brings strength to the spirit and turns sorrow to wisdom. The windows of her house look outward from the walls of the world. The pity of Gandalf, Bilbo, and Frodo allowed for another outcome, a surprise ending that was not able to be anticipated in the predictive sense. Gandalf knew that salvation might indeed arrive, but also that Frodo could not be the one to enact it himself. That pity led to this moment, perhaps the most simultaneously heartbreaking and staggeringly joyful moment in any book I've ever read. When the ring is destroyed, it is joy, but, as Tolkien said, it's poignant as grief. The same physical experience as Lewis would say, as you might have when you realize that your loved one has really died and you will not ever in this age hear his voice, hold her hand, smile at her face. Real joy at the hope of resurrection is like that. It goes through the pain and the sorrow and the loss, not around it. If we really took to heart what our hope in Christ actually is, then we would likewise be emotionally shattered and unable not to weep at it. But the hope that we are to have is that, quote, all the sad things might come untrue, and it cannot be had within the walls of this world alone. It must come from outside. It can only come to us human creatures from beyond the walls of this world that's saturated by death. Because the greatest enemy that we face is death itself. Tolkien sees our greatest need for the escapism of a fairy tale, or just generally escape, as escape from death. It's the Numenorians and the later people of Gondor who become so possessive of this earthly life that they become obsessed with death and avoiding it. And nine of their kings were given rings of power because they were so possessive and myopic in order to have their earthly, finite lives not ever end. That's not escape, that is not hope. Life is indeed proper to us human creatures, but for now, it's, our life is under the curse of death. If we are to have the proper life that we are made to have forever, then death must be conquered from, uh, by, a, by a life and action that comes from outside our world circle, circles. Hope must be anchored beyond the walls of the world. Scene five, last one, the field of Cormalin. When Sam awoke, he found that he was lying on some soft bed, but over him gently swayed wide beechen boughs, and through their young leaves sunlight glimmered, green and gold. All the air was full of a sweet mingled scent. He remembered that smell, the fragrance of Athelion. Bless me, he mused, how long have I been asleep? For the scent had borne him back to the day when he had lit his little fire under the sunny bank, and for the moment, all else between was out of waking memory. He stretched and drew a deep breath. Why, what a dream I've had, he said. I'm glad to wake. This entire chapter is not only just wonderful culmination of all of Frodo's and Sam's journey, but to me is also one of the loveliest imaginings of what a bit of our future life might hold. This is a picture of the end or the telos of hope. Awakening from your strivings to find peace and healing and joy. We hope because we long for everything sad to come untrue. We hope because we've been told a secret that our king is making all things new. 
which means that your moral deliberation now should work something like this. If it's actually possible that one day there will be no longer any more tears or mourning or pain anymore, and if this sort of scene awaits you one day, then now you can act in strange but virtuous ways and let them bear witness to the ultimate promised consolation that's coming to you. Remember what O'Donovan has said, when we let hope guide our moral reasoning, quote, even such apparently pointless acts of suffering martyrdom for the truth suddenly have a point, since they are aligned with a future known by promise, not by anticipation. That ultimate future alone underwrites the intelligibility of our human purposes now, rewarding those purposes beyond their desert and judging them in mercy. So as we read a couple more bits, just be on the lookout for things you have heard in Scripture about our eternal reward. Um, I think they're Tolkien's embellishment of or correspondence to those passages of the Bible. But Sam lay back and stared with open mouth. For a moment, between bewilderment and great joy, he couldn't answer. At last, he gasped, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? The great shadow has departed, said Gandalf. And then he laughed, and the sound was like music or water in a parched land. And as he listened, the thought came to Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment, for days upon days without count. It fell upon his ears like the echo of all the joys he had ever known. But he himself burst into tears. Then, as a sweet rain will pass down a wind of spring and the sun will shine out the clearer, his tears ceased and his laughter welled up. And laughing, he sprang from his bed. How do I feel? He cried. Well, I don't know how to say it. I feel, I feel, he waved his arms in the air. I feel like spring after winter and sun on the leaves and like trumpets and harps and all the songs that I have ever heard. Sam here is expressing hope's fulfillment. It's joy, it's, that it's effervescent, it's unable to be contained, but it gets better for him and for us. So these, great, these hobbits are now going to meet the great king. Gandalf says, he has tended you and he, now he awaits you. You shall eat and drink with him. But they're not to wear bright armor, and clean linens, They'll wear their ragged, filthy clothes, which Gandalf says will be of higher honor than anything else. As they came to an opening in the wood, they were surprised to see knights and bright mail and tall guards in silver and black standing there who greeted them with honor and bowed before them. And then one blew a long trumpet, and they went on through the Isle of Trees beside the singing stream. But on the field where they now stood, a great host was drawn up in ranks and companies glittering in the sun. And as the hobbits approached, swords were unsheathed and spears were shaken and horns and trumpets rang and men cried with many voices and in many tongues, long live the halflings, praise them with great praise. Praise them with great praise, Frodo and Samwise. Praise them, the ring bearers, praise them with great praise. And so, the red blood blushing in their faces and their eyes shining with wonder, Frodo and Sam went forward and saw that amidst the clamorous host were set three high seats built of green turves. On the highest throne in the middle, there sat a mail-clad man, and a great sword was laid across his knees, but he wore no helm. And as they drew near, he rose, and then they knew him, Changed as he was, so high and glad of face, kingly, lord of men, dark-haired with eyes of gray. Frodo ran to meet him, and Sam followed close behind. Well, if this isn't the crown of all, he said. Strider, or I'm still asleep. Yes, Sam, Strider, said Aragorn. It is a long way, is it not, from Bree, where you did not like the look of me? A long way for us all, but yours has been the darkest road. And then, to Sam's surprise and utter confusion, he bowed his knee before them. And taking them by the hand, Frodo upon his right and Sam upon his left, he led them to the throne. And setting them upon it, he turned to the men and the captains who stood by and spoke that, so that his voice rang out above all the host, crying, Praise them with great praise. 
rather than make us nervous, um, should call to mind some really precious bits of the Bible. Revelation 3, 21. To the one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. 1 Peter 1, 7. The tested genuineness of your faith is more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire. It may be, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when the glad shout had swelled up and died away again, to Sam's final and complete satisfaction and pure joy, a minstrel of Gondor stood forth and knelt and begged leave to sing. And behold, he said, Lo, lords and knights and men of valor unashamed, kings and princes and fair people of Gondor, riders of Rohan and ye sons of Elrond, Dunedain of the north and elf and dwarf and great hearts of the Shire and all free folk of the west, now listen to my lay, for I will sing to you of Frodo, of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. And when Sam heard that, he laughed aloud for sheer delight. And he stood up and he cried, O oh, great glory and splendor, all my wishes have come true. And then he wept. And all the host laughed and wept. And in the midst of their merriment and tears, the clear voice of the minstrel rose like silver and gold, and all men were hushed. And he sang to them, now in the elven tongue, now in the speech of the West, until their hearts, wounded with sweet words, overflowed, and their joy was like swords. And they passed in and out, in thought, out to regions where pain and delight flow together, and tears are the very wine of blessedness. This is the completely unlooked for happy ending that Frodo and Sam have hoped against hope could be possible. It was not achievable if they had tried to engineer it on their own terms, on their own, through their own resources. They merely had to be hopeful and therefore faithful, living as virtuous hobbits who had been chosen for the toughest of tasks. This story works on your heart as it does, largely because it has that likeness or correspondence to the primary reality, what's really true. And the scene's also, though, a well-imagined picture of the coming day in the lives of God's people when each of you will enter into his rest and your great king will proclaim over you, well done. It is an imagining, not a victory per se, but what we actually long for that victory gains us, which is rest, peace, completion, and joy. We long for the king to be victorious so that we can find healing from his hands, not because, as Faramir accuses the people of Gondor, quote, we now love war and valor as things good in themselves, both a sport and an end. Our hope is that we would live in love and peace forever. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Your hope has been given grounds. God's past work in Jesus Christ and his future work that he has promised and revealed to you, but also your acts of love now are grounded in that faith and pointing forward to that hope that the salvation of God's people and his world doesn't depend on you, but it has been brought to pass from outside the circle of this world. And so your acts now bear witness to the promise that one day the world will be mended, as Tom Bombadil says, by God in full. Reading the Lord of the Rings attentively can be one really excellent, lovely way of cultivating exactly that sort of hope it's essential to acting now with courage, endurance, and the pity of Bilbo. 
This presentation was made possible by the generous contributors to the Serious Joy Scholarship, permitting our graduates to launch into life and ministry without a burden of student loan debt.